to another episode of the Edmonds Moms Room podcast. We are so lucky to have Gabriella Price from Bayside Birth and Midwifery with us today. So thank you so much for coming and sharing your knowledge about what you do, and, and we're excited to meet you. Yay, thanks for having me. Yeah. <laughs> so I have two kids myself, and when I found out I was pregnant, I did not think of doing anything but going to my OB. And I didn't know really there were other options. So what my desire to do today is, is to really bring awareness to different types of birthing options for moms. So grateful that you're here to share your experience so we can really help moms know that there might be more options. Yeah. Especially maybe if their first go wasn't what they really wanted or didn't have a great experience. So I'm really, thank you for sharing everything with you, with us. Yes, I'm so happy to be here and spread the knowledge of midwifery into the world. <laughs> yeah. So will you tell us a little bit about who you are? Sure. Okay. So I'm Gabby, obviously. I'm from Kentucky. I'm not a Washington native. I moved here about eight years ago, I think, and moved straight to Everett and haven't left Everett since. I'm a big Everett fan. And I started midwifery school a couple of years after moving here and worked Worked at a birth center for a few years, which was amazing, and started my practice two years ago, I think, three, almost three. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, and it's grown ever since, and we've been so well received by the community, and yeah, it's just amazing. Fantastic. <laughs> and you have another provider with you? Yes, so okay. we just got a second provider. Her name is Sadie, and she is incredible and super friendly, and she's also an herbalist, so we're doing a lot of incorporating of that into our practice and all the fun things, yeah. Great. Cool. Well, could you tell us a little bit, before we dive into your practice specifically, could you tell us just a little bit about midwifery? People may may or may not have heard about midwifery. There are, in general, two types of midwives. There is the nurse midwife that practices primarily in hospital. Around Washington, there are a couple that do out-of-hospital birth. And then there's our type of midwife, which is a licensed midwife and also a certified professional midwife. Those are the two licenses we carry. And that means that we work out of hospital. Um, And that is birth center, home birth. And we also do home-based midwifery care as well, as well as in our office. What's home-based midwifery care? So that's where we do, like, all of your prenatal and postpartum care in your own home. So much like oh. you do for a lot of people, yes. we do that as well. Okay. So people with, like, older children or transportation issues or, you know, life is crazy, whatever they need, we can provide in-home care for them, awesome. which is super rad. And since we're doing home birth anyways... It kind of makes the whole experience, just makes it a lot more, there's a lot more continuity. And we get to already be in their space and get to know their pets and their children and their kitchen and where their bathrooms are. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. Well, that's great. That, that, I mean, that really answers my question. Perfect. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about home birth. Yeah. And why someone would choose a home birth. So there's a lot of amazing evidence out in the world about out-of-hospital birth and how most low-risk people have better outcomes for both mom and babies when they're choosing to birth out of hospital. And that's because their likelihood of facing intervention is a lot lower, that cascade of interventions, if you know that term, which is like you go to the hospital and you get Pitocin and then you get epidural and that raises your risk for C-section. Etc. So being in the home space, you're not really exposed to those options. Yeah, you right there yes. just for a second because what you said, I want to break it down. Okay. Because just tell us the cascade because I think you're <laughs> speaking to like so many women. Unfortunately, I yeah. think you're speaking to so many women. So could you just say that cascade? Yeah. That it's actually a thing. Yeah. Um, and how it translates to C-section. Yeah, absolutely. So the cascade of interventions, it's a term that we're especially now underscoring seeing the rates of hospital outcomes um, and maternal and fetal mortality rates. And that cascade of interventions basically is where you go to the hospital and regardless of what your situation is, you're introduced to a medication or an intervention. And that tends to and raises your risk for the next medication or intervention. And the further down that rabbit hole you go, the higher and higher your likelihood of having a C-section is. Mm -hmm. So if you, for example, go into the hospital and you, it's your 
first baby, you're having some contractions, but maybe you're two centimeters. If you're there for six hours, maybe you don't have a lot of change, which in the home birth setting we know is very normal because early labor can take a long time. Then they're going to tell you, well, you're not making any progress. Let's introduce Pitocin. And Pitocin is really hard. It's really hard on the body. And it, yeah, it's intense. So then you'll probably have an epidural, which is completely reasonable. And then those types of interventions introduce the higher and higher risk of the C-section. I'm happy to hear you say that. Yeah. Because, you know, I hear, I work with moms who are like, you know, they want this natural birth. They want this vaginal delivery. Maybe they want a V-back. And Mm so, like, and a lot of them know that cascade of interventions yeah. and want maybe the second time around to avoid it or whatever that be. So it's just cool to hear you validate that. Mm-hmm. So I really thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of families too, you know, sadly in our country, we're not being introduced to what maternity care is or maternal mm-hmm. health is. And you're not learning it until you're actually pregnant yourself. And then you're kind of on a time clock of learning all of this nuanced political health information in a 40-week span. Most people don't even know they're pregnant until 12 weeks, so really 30 to 28 weeks, that you have to then dissect and break down and hope that you have enough to go into this experience as an armed, which is sad to say, an armed receiver of healthcare. And then, you know, that's where so much trauma happens too. Because yeah. it's impossible to learn all of that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that's great to hear. So, so I cut you off. No, you're to gonna... <laughs> ask you to, as you're you know going into home birth and talking about home birth. So, could you tell us a little bit more about why home birth? Yeah, I mean, that's a huge reason why. But yes, absolutely. Continue your yeah. So you know, avoiding the cascade of interventions, and I think a lot of people think that when they choose home birth, they're there then um, cutting themselves off from the possibility of an epidural or um, the possibility of emergency care. And that's just not true. We carry all of the emergency equipment that they would have in the hospital, other than the operating room. And if you decide halfway through your labor, like, Ugh, I need. I need something else. I need pain management. Then we easily call and we set it up and we go and then you get it and it's fine. So it kind of differs practice to practice, but in our practice, we go with our families and we stay usually until baby's born. And that way we can also kind of act as a buffer for them because it is a little bit of a culture shock going from a home to a hospital. So yeah, we like to stay and provide support. With home birth, yes, you get those benefits and then you also get to be in your space. You get to stay in your bed and shower in your shower and wear your clothes and eat your food and do all the things that are naturally producing amazing oxytocin levels and keeping adrenaline nice and low. Um, And that's where we see the best birth outcomes because you've been able to just relax and surrender to the birth process. So, yeah. Oh, that's great. Thank you. (laughs) Could you tell us a little bit about some of the remedies that you use in your practice? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) So with myself and then our second midwife, we incorporate a lot of herbs and some of those are in, are available to our clients through our apothecary. And with that, we have Sitz herbs, which if you haven't heard of those is a blend of really healing herbs that are antimicrobial, antibiotic, and also help to encourage healing, which is awesome. So we offer that to our families. We also have a few other topical things for different ailments in pregnancy. So there's this thing that you can get sometimes called pups. And it's a rash that can be really common in pregnancy. And it's really irritating. And it's It doesn't mean anything. It's not dangerous to anyone, but it's really itchy and it sucks. So we have a really cool soap that we offer with pine tar oil in it, which sounds really gross. And it smells really gross too, but it's, it is actually very helpful. And then we also use a lot of herbs and recommend a lot of herbs in our care. So different things from like anxiety to pain to healing, all the things. Nice. Yeah. Can someone come to you for herb care and support during pregnancy without doing a home birth? Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things that we do particularly in our practice is offer co-care. So that means that they can come to us for prenatal care, even if they're planning a hospital birth. Okay. So they can receive all of the amazing benefits of having individualized 
hour-long one-on-one midwifery care appointments and still have a planned hospital birth. So that's really good for folks who just want to be in the hospital. If they're planning a vaginal birth after a cesarean, they're having a breech baby, twins, all the fun things. And then, yeah, we also offer just if you want to come and learn about herbs and hang out, we'll probably have a few workshops coming up. Postpartum care as well is so important and so underscored in our society Mm -hmm. that we want to offer the co-care option to people who are postpartum as well. Because if you birth in the hospital, most likely the only care you're going to receive is a couple days after baby's born and then six weeks later. And that's a huge gap to like have so much happen in terms of lactation or postpartum depression that you're just falling through the cracks. And that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I've seen, do you mind sharing, you mentioned like VBAC and different mm-hmm. things for that for that type of care, but do you mind sharing who's not a candidate for home birth versus, and then who yeah. is a candidate? Yeah, absolutely. So for home birth, again, particular to our practice, and I would say most practices in this area, a good candidate would be someone who is quote, low risk, which means no out-of-control diabetes, no out-of-control hypertension, which is blood pressure. Typically, if you're having multiples or planning a VBAC, then usually those things are most safe happening in the hospital, just because the likelihood of something being a little bit more complicated and happening, those risks go up. And I generally agree with that. I feel like if it's if you're not deemed as a low risk person, it is very appropriate to have a hospital birth. They are not the enemy. They're an amazing tool. But that doesn't mean you should miss miss out on having really good high quality personal consideration in your pregnancy care. Nice. That's a great way to put it. <laughs> so that's who's done a candidate. So who is a candidate? So a good candidate is pretty much anyone who is healthy and like medically healthy. That's not necessarily cutting out people who have autoimmune disease or, yeah, that's really the only one I can think of. So let me clarify, someone with autoimmune disease, they would be okay? Autoimmune disease, for the most part, is fine for out-of-hospital birth. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the more that we're becoming aware of our bodies in more nuanced ways, the more that we're seeing that a lot of people have autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And that could be your thyroid or Lyme disease, et cetera. Those people are pretty good candidates for out-of-hospital birth. So yeah, most people who are of childbearing ability are good candidates for out-of-hospital birth. Even if you're, quote, advanced maternal age, which is over the age of 35, which is a very arbitrary number, you're still a good candidate for out-of-hospital oh, birth. That's, com- <laughs> that's comforting to hear. That's great. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. What other things should we know about home birth? And I think a lot of times people, when they envision home birth, envision like some super granola experience or like a, a birth in 1600 happening in a cabin on a dirt floor, <laughs> which is probably fairly accurate for some situations. But for the most part, home birth is happening all around. Your friends, your family are having home births. It's pretty regular, especially in the Pacific Northwest. So I think that for most people, it's really attainable and it's a really amazing experience to have. And I think it's just a matter of learning what it is, maybe talking to your friends who have had it and taking that next step. And also knowing that you deserve an out of hospital birth. It's an amazing experience. And if you're a low, low risk candidate, Check it out. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> I want to touch on a few things that you said. Just like, you know, what could be running through some of the moms' minds or moms to be that are listening to this. So say you live in an apartment. Mm-hmm. Could you have a home birth in an apartment? Yeah, okay. of course. Cool. I've been to so many births in apartments. Yeah. Um, I think if you're in an apartment and you're considering it, the big things would just be like you could give your neighbors a little heads up that you might be having a human, which can be a loud experience, yeah. but, it, <laughs> but it is totally reasonable to have a home birth in an apartment. Awesome. Mm-hmm. awesome. Cool. Yeah. And do you have any clients who'd want a birth outside who like really have an outside birth? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. If it is environmentally weather appropriate, like 
you can birth wherever you want. And again, that's the awesome benefit of a home birth is I've had people who've been like, I have this space in my backyard set up with a tub where I'm looking into the woods and I'm surrounded by all the lovely things and that's where I want to birth. And you get that option, which is so rad. And you're not going to have like all of these people in your face constantly messing with monitors and taking away from that personalized experience. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. Thank yeah. you for sharing that. Yeah. And then back to the wrists a little bit because, mm-hmm. you know, some moms might have gestational diabetes mm-hmm. but are craving that home birth. Mm-hmm. If it's regulated, is that still that's still an option? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So if gestational diabetes, we test for it around 28 weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you fail quote, fail that test, then we're doing a lot of counseling around nutrition and exercise. And then if it's still uncontrolled, we'll kind of reach out to higher level care providers. And if we can find that your blood sugars are regulated within those suggestions without insulin would be the big cutoff, then you can totally have home birth. Nice. Just a matter of controlling the blood sugars. Okay. Mm-hmm. And same goes for blood pressure? Blood pressure is a little harder because we can't really control blood pressure without medication. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, there are some herbs that we recommend to help with blood pressure. But if it's going up, it's going to go up. And if it requires medication, then it does require a next level of care, okay. meaning a hospital birth, just because we can't rule out the larger complications of high blood pressure. Absolutely. In the home space. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. What about weight? Weight. Come on. Everyone can have a home birth. It doesn't matter your weight. We are a body affirming practice. It is so silly that so many people, based on their body types, are receiving so much shame in maternity care. It is awful. So nice to hear you say that. Yeah. Because you get the, at least when I was pregnant, the scale, and then it's this whole anxiety going. Mm -hmm. We're talking about that a little bit. You know, I think it's a hang up for a lot of people and make give some serious anxiety when they walk into the doctor's office and they have to leave a pee sample and automatically step on the scale. Yes. Which is then they take your blood pressure, right? <laughs> and so, but like you, it's so mind boggling and women get so worried about it yeah. throughout their entire pregnancy. And it's one of the things that I think can make you really not feel great about yourself. So yes. tell us how you yes. manage people's weights. Yes. One, sure. BMI is total garbage. If someone is telling you that your health is one way or the other based on your BMI, find a new healthcare provider. And two, we don't we don't go off of weight in our practice. We don't ask people to weigh themselves. We don't ask people to track their weight. If they want to, great, that's up to them. But it's not a good measure of if you're healthy or if your baby's healthy or if your pregnancy is going well, or if your risk of C-section is raising. It's just, weight is just for you to feel like society is coming in on you. And we don't need that. Like, especially now in the world today, we should reject all measures of these silly, arbitrary things that tell us that our worth, our capability, our intelligence are lesser because we're not meeting some stupid measurement. So let it all go. (laughs) I love that. Thank you. It's so silly. I have seen complications across the board regardless of your body type. I've also Mm. seen very healthy, healthy pregnancies across the board with all body types. It does not mean anything. If you are a healthy person and you are eating healthy, you know, avoid the Red Bulls would be a good thing, I would say, then it doesn't matter your body type. Cool. You know, the medical professional in me, though, does play, like, the fear game a Mm -hmm. little bit. And what if something, and I don't necessarily think about it from, like, the maternal my standpoint because I've had two kids and it's it's been fine with without you know, needing a lot of assistance hospital wise, but from a knowing my child will be okay. What if there's an emergency with the baby? Yeah. When I birth the baby, is there, is there any rationale to that fear? I think it's one completely reasonable to feel that fear okay. because it is another body that you have no control of. So everyone feels like they're taking a little bit of a chance there. But we do carry things that are required with neonatal resuscitation. We maintain our certification with them on a regular basis and practice as well regularly so that if something were to happen with a baby that was born that needed resuscitation, we're equipped to take care of that. Our local 
paramedics and EMTs also know that home birth is a popular option. So they are also prepared. And often we learn together how to make that transition smooth. So if we do have to call for paramedics for a newborn, then it's a lot less chaotic than it might seem or could be. The other thing too is that for the most part, if something's going on with baby, we're going to hear it before baby's born and be able to make the appropriate transfer. Um, So that's really nice. That helps us to really lower the risk of any emergency situation happen and keep everyone, including your baby, as low risk as possible. Um, And the awesome thing with living in the Pacific Northwest is that We work really closely with our local hospitals, so I'm local to Providence, and we have regular meetings to talk about, you know, what is an appropriate transfer criteria, how are we supposed to go about that with protocols, and oftentimes it's very, very smooth to go from home to hospital. Nice. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And it's good to hear all your, you know, all your knowledge and what you provide all these moms, because you are probably saving Maternity care in a, in a lot of ways, <laughs> um, so many ways. And one of the things that I, it's so hard to hear day after day is, you know, people's disappointment or feeling like maybe they failed internalizing it, even though it's, you know, more situational. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so Our healthcare system is really facing some very serious systemic issues. Mm-hmm. And I agree. I have lots of people who come to me with their second or subsequent pregnancies and, feel either let down by their healthcare provider or the medical system, or like you said, internalize it and make it a very shameful experience for themselves, which is not irrational. Mm -hmm. That's what we tend to do is bring that all in and blame it on ourselves. And it's so hard to hear that knowing that the problem is really systemic. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. (laughs) Okay. Final question. And then I'll let you go (laughs) leave free and enjoy the sunshine. If you work with a family, do you require, like, they have a doula? Do you require that they have a pediatrician set up? What uh, what kind of resources? Some people just want it to be, you know, very much them and maybe yeah. their family. Or yeah. is a doula required for you? No, a doula is not required. wonderful. And mm-hmm. people don't know about doulas enough. And we'll do a <laughs> podcast with the doula as well. But just that's not a requirement Yeah, no, it's not a requirement. We do highly recommend doulas, though. They are incredible and priceless to the birth experience, especially if you're planning a hospital birth. Um, But even if you're not and you're planning to be at home, they can make a home birth situation be amazing. So there, you know, I think when we're thinking about doulas, a lot of people think, oh, my partner's supportive, it'll be fine, which for the most part is probably true. But there's a You know, watching your partner, if you are a non-birthing parent, experience labor and birth can be really overwhelming and can leave a lot of people kind of, they withdraw and they step back and they're not able to really give you what you need if you're birthing. So having a doula who can be that space filler and also provide you with extra education and give you some tips depending on where you're planning to birth can really like next level your birth experience so we don't require it but we definitely encourage it i love that thank you for sharing the importance of a doula that's great so this has been an amazing podcast thank you so much for sharing everything and we're we're so grateful for everything you provide our community so thank you yes thank you Edmonds Moms Room podcast is brought to you by Body Motion Physical Therapy. We help women through pregnancy and beyond so they can live active, confident, and healthy lives.